At the end of the semester, you'll take an, an oral examination, which is a one-on-one -on -one interview with me, but in front of at least some of your peers. So it will be public. The oral exam will represent your crowning achievements of the course. Everything that you've gained, your knowledge, your, your speaking skills, your critical thinking skills, your familiarity with the text, you will then put on display in the oral exam. So it's really the ultimate assessment in the course, and the most important. So it's a must to pass. So maybe it's kind of time to start thinking about it now. There is an exhaustive description in the syllabus, and next week we'll plan for midterm exams. We'll have a midterm oral exam, just to kind of give you a feel for what this is going to be like. But what I'd like to do is if, if I could have a volunteer to do a kind of mock oral examination based on just more journal entry. Your final is going to be based on a paper. Your midterm will just be based on maybe a couple of journal entries. So I will design questions that get you to talk about what you know from your paper and your bibliography, that's your readings. So would there be one, and Mr. Romero, I was kind of thinking of you, you wrote a really good journal entry on Pythagoras, and I was thinking of the question, according to Pythagoras, how can memory be important to friendship? So I, I just, I'm looking for a volunteer who'd be willing to kind of do a mock oral exam where I would just ask you that question. sample bad job interview. What this actress does a lot of things wrong. Focus, however, on her inability to describe her own virtues. She may be a very good employee, she just doesn't know how to explain it. So take a look, just a couple of minutes. Sorry, just a couple of minutes. This picture. Thank you. I'm disappointed. Tell me about yourself. Well, um, <clears throat> I'm hardworking. <laughs> um, if you give me a project to do and uh, there's a deadline that it needs to be done, I can you know, put my head down and focus on that and get the project done. <laughs> um, sorry, I don't mean to giggle. <laughs> um, this is a hard question. I, I, uh, I'm a thought this way about myself. Um, I, um, I'm very honest. I, um, if you ask me something, I'll tell you the truth. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yes, I'm hardworking. I'm honest. My friends would tell you that I'm pretty easygoing. That I'm, um, you know, real easy to be around, and uh, I don't really make waves or anything at work. So I, you know, I'm a really good employee. Um, that way. <laughs> um, let's see what else. I guess that's about it. That Trite is something that's used, so overused it's meaningless. So you don't want to walk into a job interview and tell an employer you're hardworking because everybody says that. So she's not choosing precise words to describe her virtues. 
She's also failing to back up her self-descriptions with actual experiences. So what is it, what would Aristotle, what kind of word would Aristotle use for someone who's hard working? Is there a good adjective that came out of reading or any of our conversation? Maybe ambitious. Ambitious, that's really compelling. I'm an ambitious person. And then you tell a story about how you worked your way up in a company or how you faced a difficult schedule in order to maintain a position that you have to impress an employer. So ambitious, that's a really colorful word. That reading, hang on to it, is full of outstanding adjectives. You might not want to use righteous indignation, right? But they're just outstanding. So start thinking about who you are as a person and how you would describe that in a clear and compelling way. I might pull in a good job interview next class and sort of talk about what goes well. So this is just a way of starting to think about what the oral exam should be. And my hope is that the constant practice, as Ms. Mrs. Chavez pointed out, the constant practice of forcing yourself to speak to a group, forcing yourself to refer to a text and your knowledge of it, it's going to help you with your oral communication skills down the road. That is the ultimate goal here. I felt it was important to go back and talk about something from Plato that I didn't cover in, in my lecture on Socrates and Plato, but they came out of some of the journal entries. It's the idea of the powers of the soul. And Plato's notion of the soul stands at the roots of modern psychology. Plato, in a sense, was the first psychologist because he began examining the human personality and how it functions. The Greek word psuche or psyche in English means soul. So the word psychology comes from two Greek words, psuche and what word is this? The study of? Yes, logos. It means word or reason. So psuche and logos means how do we explain what the soul is? Plato, in a sense, was the original psychologist, and he had this theory that Socrates explains in a dialogue called the Phaedrus, that the soul is like a chariot. It has these three powers or capacities. The Greek word is dunamis, which also means potential, like in uh, potential energy and kinetic energy. It's the Greek word dunamis. So the soul has these three capacities or powers. Reason, the higher emotions and the bodily appetites, or physical desires. And the whole point of it is, like, so if, if the soul is like a chariot, it's, it's your desires that drive the chariot that make it go. So the bodily desires are basically hunger and lust and the, the need for physical comfort, like a warmth. Those are physical desires that drive us. The higher emotions would be Things like pride and ambition, or even the, the envy, the kind of envy that drives us to emulate someone who's a role model. So we have these higher emotions, but we also have more physical emotions. All of our emotions can lead us astray. So the horses, if the driver is not controlling them, is, are going to pull that thing off the road. So Plato's point was, our emotions are very important in driving us but we've got to control them. It's the reason that controls them. I, I kind of like to think of it in terms of your head, your heart, and your stomach. So the head is the thinking part of us, and that's the part that needs to be in control. Our emotions, our feelings, and our physical desires cannot be allowed to guide or control our actions. And that was the whole platonic ideal. One could argue with this model Maybe there are times when the reason shouldn't be in control. Maybe we emphasize reason too much. But this was Plato's idea, and it was his original thinking about psychology. This is going to come with a series of journal entries. So as we move through the semester, and you're doing more journal writing, and you're doing more speaking, start to focus on using precise verbs to explain your opinions. Many Americans tend to use the words, I feel and I believe, for almost everything. Let's limit our use of the word feel to emotions. So saying, I feel sad or I feel angry, would be a legitimate use of the term feel. 
But to say, I feel that President Trump is a wonderful president, that's not a feeling, it's an opinion. So let's start to use precise verbs of expression to describe what it is we're trying to convey. And, and making that a habit, even in seminar, right, as we talk to each other, try to bring these into your daily life as well. It would be a great reflective pose if you find yourself using a precise verb, verb of expression in an ordinary conversation. So anyway, I'm going to go through a list of these verbs, maybe five or six of them. For each verb, write your own sentence in your journal and see what you think. This one we're already familiar with. And some of you have been using it in posts and in discussion. Infer. To infer is to draw a conclusion from evidence. We make inferences all the time. We talked about that with the Mediterranean philosophers. So I might say, for example, dark clouds are massing in the west. I infer that a storm is coming. Or light from distant galaxies is red shifted. Scientists infer that they are moving apart. All, sci all scientists do is infer. So infer is a great word to use for scientific or even legal conclusions. So infer, we see if you can think of a sentence of your own based on the word infer. So for business majors, Ms. Robles, your business, right? What observations would you lead you to infer that a business is doing well? study makes inferences, but just from different kinds of evidence. So infer, that would be one thing. Believe is also a word that Americans overuse all of the time. We use believe when what we really mean is infer or think. To believe, this is my personal opinion, should be reserved for explaining conclusions that we draw based on trust or faith. So for example, I believe that my husband is faithful to me. Do I have evidence of that? No. I don't send a private investigator to follow him around all day. And in fact, the data say that most men cheat on their wives. So it's not an inference. It's something I think is true, just based purely on personal trust. For people of religious faith, they might say, I believe that God created the universe and that the universe is good. That's a religious belief. We get into an awful lot of problems when we start to use the word belief for things that are really scientific. So when I, when I read a journalist who says, scientists believe that, I get so angry because scientists don't believe anything. They infer or they conclude. So I, I think well, we could avoid a lot of problems in our discourse if we really reserve the word belief for conclusions that are based purely on relationships not for science, not for history, not for anything else. Mrs. Chavez? I would say so. If I were to say I believe I have the right to like marry who I want, would is that the right, or should I have said I think I have the right? Because to me, it's like I don't think like that. You know what I mean? That's not. It's a moral kind of. I think that might go in the category of assumptions. But believe could be a good word for it because in a sense, you're putting your faith in a first principle, right. the principle of human rights. And that ultimately does boil down to faith. No one can prove that rights exist. We believe that all human beings have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Well, you can't prove that. That's not in our DNA. It's a belief or an assumption. So an assumption is different from an inference. This question, I think, came up in the journals in that, or maybe a post, to assume is to draw a conclusion without evidence. To infer is to draw a conclusion with evidence. To assume is to draw a conclusion without evidence. 
Assumptions are often unconscious. We often make them without even being aware of it. They're not always bad. So we assume, for example, let's see, well here is, is a line from the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all people are created equal. That is an assumption. Self-evident means something you can't prove, but everybody knows it. Sometimes assumptions, however, do take the form of stereotypes and biases. I assume that students who sit in the back of the classroom are disengaged and disinterested. I'm constantly, however, checking that myself. I'm checking my own assumptions to make sure that I'm not judging people based on this. So an assumption is a conclusion, or to assert a proposition, that's a better way to put it. I wrote this and then forgot. To assert a proposition without a basis in evidence sometimes unconsciously Every single major field, say. I was just gonna ask about assume. So like, let's say um, my friend hasn't spoken to me in a few days. Um, I assume he's mad at me. You infer. You That's infer. an inference. The evidence is he hasn't spoken to you. That's evidence. It's an observation, okay. right? So it doesn't have to be like, for me to infer, my life, it can still be like technically that's a life. It's an inference. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, that's a really he, good question. Yeah. He, he might not be mad at me. That's why I was wondering. Like, Correct. Would it be an assumption? And remember, inferences are never a hundred percent certain. They can always be wrong. But just the fact that you're aware of that mental process is really important. So often we jump to conclusions without considering, without really thinking about how our minds are working. It's a great, great example. Every major field of study has first principles, a set of basic assumptions that are the foundation on which that discipline is built. And a wonderful, when we get to the study of the modern philosophers, a wonderful project for you would be to explore the thinkers who laid the foundations of your field. So for example, in economics, Adam Smith is one of those foundational thinkers. He assumes that the free market correct itself. He calls it the invisible hand. And today, that is the foundation of much economic theory. In math, there are first principles. The assumption that we can add and subtract numbers is a first principle that's unprovable. Okay. To argue is to draw a conclusion through a rational thought process. In philosophy, the word argue doesn't mean have a fight with someone. It means to draw a conclusion through a train of reasoning rational thought process, particularly a syllogism. So if you look back in your journal, we wrote syllogisms, I think it was last week, those, those sets of three statements where if you, if you agree with two statements, you have to agree with the third. So uh, here is an example. Illegal drug use is harmful to athletes, we can prove that. If athletes are harmed, the team will be harmed, that's a reasonable assumption. The conclusion is, therefore, illegal drug use is harmful to teens. That's an argument. It's a train of reasoning that takes you from step one to step two to step three. And arguments can become very complex. In law, you make arguments based on precedents, correct? On legal precedents or on what the law the folks mm -hmm. say. So this process is important in law. So to argue is to draw a conclusion based on our logical deduction or our own reason. Okay, and I've got three more. These are three wonderful verbs, and there are more of these in the English language, that express inferences with a greater degree of tentativeness, less certitude. So when I personally am talking about the future, and I'm not sure what the outcome is going to be, or I'm talking maybe about a friend's behavior and I'm not really sure what's going on, I might use the word reckon, or imagine, or speculate. So my friend hasn't called me in three days, Imagine he's mad at me. I might use imagine for that. So these are words that can convey inference, but with a greater degree of tentativeness. I imagine that my students sometimes feel bad when they forget to turn in assignments. I don't know for sure how they feel. This is me trying to imagine how they might feel. I speculate that, and I really do speculate. In a few decades, our petroleum-based economy will collapse. That's a reasonable inference, but I can't make a super strong argument for it. I reckon that the Irish will win the championship. I hope, right? Or hope. That's another good verb. But I don't know that for sure. So 
again, just you don't have to write a sentence for all of these, maybe just pick one that seems reasonable to you. But we've got these wonderful verbs in the English language, and choosing verbs that really precisely get at what you're trying to say, bless you, is a great critical thinking tool. Speaking of virtue and, and cultivating virtue, critical thinking, you'll strengthen your critical thinking if you choose your words carefully because you're aware of your own thought processes. We've got infer, believe, assume, argue, and then imagine, speculate, or reckon. Any questions about the problem? These will come back to haunt us all on the final. So start building this word bank. Okay, another thing we need to talk about is logical fallacies. A fallacy is a mistake in reasoning. If you start to become aware of what the fallacies are, you can avoid them in your own thinking, and you can also dismantle other people's arguments. So if somebody's making an argument to you, trying to convince you of something, and you can spot their fallacy, boom, you won the argument. And you can avoid the same mistakes yourself. So I've chosen one fallacy for this week called ad hominem, a Latin phrase for at the person. So it's the idea that when two people are having a debate and they disagree, one person, instead of actually responding to that other person's arguments rationally, just attacks them. You're a bad person. A lot of this is happening with the Catholic Church right now. I happen to be Catholic. We are yet again in the news because of allegations of clergy sex abuse. So if I, as a Catholic, am speaking out on an issue, say, say racism, because Catholicism condemns racism, someone might look at me and say, oh, the Catholic Church is just a bunch of abusers. We can't trust anything you guys say. That's an odd hominem argument. So instead of just telling, like, instead of it countering my claim that racism is wrong, they're just attacking me as a person. So it's a common tactic. And I, I do want to show you a video, it's a little bit lengthy, where a comedian and social commentator is kind of analyzing how these, this particular fallacy is used by the current presidential administration. I do not intend to be political, truly, but this analysis is so cogent and it is so important to recognize how these fallacies appear in our public discourse that I think it's worth taking a look at. I do apologize in advance for the commentator's profanity and his sense of humor. I personally find it funny. I realize that a lot of people might not. So again, this is not intended to be political, but it's a cogent analysis first of how the president sometimes fails to use language clearly. It doesn't necessarily mean he's a bad leader. But when we communicate, speaking in clear, complete sentences is really, really important. So we kind of start with that. Then he's going to get into these three techniques, and we're just going to take a look at the first one. So we're kind of jumping into the middle of the scene. Okay. Ouch. How our leaders engage with us, and how in turn that affects the way that we engage with one another. It's why even the notion of getting him can feel so hopelessly futile. And let's first stipulate that it definitely doesn't help that so often what Trump says is complete nonsense. We often read transcripts of Trump's speeches, and it's something that everyone should actually do once in a while, because when you strip away his blindly confident, entertaining delivery and just read his words, it is staggering how incoherent he is. Here is a word-for-word -word reading of a speech where he talked about the Iran nuclear deal. You look at the nuclear deal, the thing that really bothers me, it would have been so easy and it's not as important as these lives are. Nuclear is so powerful. My uncle explained that to me many, many years ago, the power, and that was 35 years ago. He would explain the power of what's going to happen and he was right, who would have thought? But when you look at what's going on with the four prisoners, now it used to be three, now it's four, but when it was three, and even now, I would have said, it's all in the messenger. Fellas, and it is fellas, because you know, they don't, they haven't figured that the women are smarter right now than the men, so you know, it's going to take them about another 100 50 years, but the Persians are great negotiators, the Iranians are great negotiators, so, and they, they just killed, they just killed us. Holy shit! That is not a functional use of language, that is a drunk driver crashing a pickup truck full of alphabet soup. 
Trump's actual speech patterns sound like when you write a long text by choosing only the predictive text your iPhone suggests for you. Seriously, we wrote a message like that, starting with the words, the nuclear, and here is what we got. The nuclear test program was not opposed by the other person who knows what they want, and then the delay is not being done by any other country, and that is not the only way to make sure the world can do more things, and things like that, and gentlemen, and then the other people who have been told to leave them alone with their children, who are also very sad. That makes exactly as much, and potentially more sense, than Trump's speech about the Iraq nuclear deal, meaning an iPhone would be a more coherent president of the United States. But with Trump, we are familiar enough with his speech patterns that you get the basic gist of what he's trying to say. The real damage isn't in how he says things, but from three key techniques that he uses to insulate himself from criticism and consequence. And if we are not extremely careful, all three can have serious impacts that far outlast his presidency. And let's... So the first one is what, what in philosophy we call ad hominem. He just uses a slightly different... He uses a different word for it. Start with the first one delegitimizing the media. Now, Trump has been attacking the press since he declared his candidacy, and in a broader sense, he's been waging war on the very concept of truth ever since he first turned to his mom and said, Dada, and she said, no, I'm Mama, and he said, fake news and shit his pants. <laughs> now, the difference now is, he's crying fake news as President of the United States, and he is openly proud of it, to the point that he recently tried to take ownership of the term itself. The media is is really the word, I, I think one of the greatest of all terms I've, I've come up with is fake. I guess other people have used it perhaps over the years, but I've never noticed it. He just took credit for inventing the term fake news, which for the record, he did not. Meaning what he just said was technically fake, fake news news. <laughs> and you can imagine him saying, well, I'm not the first politician to criticize the press. What about Hillary Clinton? What about Barack Obama? What about Bernie Sanders? And that actually brings us to Trump's second technique, something called whataboutism. And we'll get to that one later. But this is where this administration, rather than countering the arguments that are made against their policies, just says, oh, it's fake news. That's an ad hominem argument. And just, so maybe the next, if, if this happens to you, if you're in a conflict with someone, or a debate with someone, or an argument with someone, and they sort of attack you, notice it. And you can disarm it by saying, you're just attacking me. You're not really addressing the question that I'm asking, right? So see if, you know, you can find a way to sort of use these things in your everyday interactions with people. All right. So that was Fallacy of the Week. And now I have to find where I was. Let's see. All exams, verbs, here we go. Okay, one more thing, and then we are done for today. I put on the syllabus that we were going to study the Greek mathematician Euclid. He is very important to know about, so do put just a brief note in your journal about him. Euclid was an African philosopher from the city of Alexandria in Egypt. He lived around the same time as Plato and Aristotle, like around the 300s BC. Plato thought that geometry was so important, he put a sign over the academy, the school, saying, let no one enter here who has not studied geometry. And Euclid's book that was written over 2,000 years ago was the textbook in geometry until the mid-1900s. So it has, it's a book that has enduring value. So just be aware of Euclid, E-U-C-L-I-D as being the ancient philosopher from Egypt, from Africa, who really developed the study of geometry and put it all together into one book, essentially giving birth to mathematics. You might notice that in most American cities, there's always a Euclid Avenue. It's named after him. It's architects and urban planners giving credit to the person who first developed geometry. So just be aware. And the name of his work is Elements, Euclid Elements. And in past classes occasionally, like once every couple of years or so, I, I will, we will look very, very closely at the first book of Euclid's Elements and demonstrate geometric propositions, something you may have done in high school. My students this semester, however, expressed an interest in studying, this was in my day class, in studying music theory a little bit more deeply. 
Music is related to math, and music theory is just as challenging as geometry. So, I dug up the music theory sort of textbook that, that we used in my liberal arts program in college. It's not a primary source, but the author attempts to weave together primary sources like Pythagoras and Plato. So it contains primary sources like the works of the philosophers, and it's att an attempt to explain music theory from the ground up. So why do we hear music the way we hear it, and why is it beautiful? Now this is a challenging reading, and there are lots of terms to look up. In fact, I'd like to take you through some of them. So you only have to annotate about eight pages closely, because you're going to be looking up a lot of words. There's also, I encourage you to, to try the Greek alphabet if you want. If you can't, just kind of highlight those words, and we'll talk about them when you come to class. But I've got a, a handout with the Greek alphabet on it, too, if you can try. So here's an optional project. When we come to class, we're going to mess around with instruments in some way, shape, or form. Exactly how I'm going to provide that, I don't know. But one way to do it is, have you guys ever done that? See if you can figure out and practice getting a tone out of a bottle drink. Right? Anybody can do it. You just blow across the hole. <laughs> I play flute. Flute players can get a tone out of anything with a hole in it. But try it. See if you can do it. So bring in a bottled drink. And what we're going to discover is the amount of water in the drink changes the tone. So we're going to kind of experiment with that. Get enough of these things and you guys can figure out how to do it. But that's optional. I'm not going to give you homework that's not in the syllabus. Okay. But do let's take a quick look at page one and go over some of those Greek terms that might be a little bit confusing because they're keywords we should know. Let's see. Okay, so if you look at the page that says introduction at the top and one at the bottom, take a quick look at that. That first paragraph has probably about a dozen words that you, I, I hope you will look up and write the definitions and really learn them. Quadrivium, trivium, logic, rhetoric, grammar, what are those things? What are the muses? Who were the muses? So this is a description of how music fits into the liberal arts. And the writer's trying to make a case that music is the ultimate art. It embraces everything. He's trying to make that case. In the second paragraph, this essay explores the mathematics of the, the musical intervals. An interval is the difference between two tones. So like a higher tone and a lower tone. Let me see if I can change the tone in my water bottle. Mm. Mm. Hear the difference? That's an interval. So interval, intervals can be smaller or greater if I poured a lot of water out of the bottle and then tried to play it again. Mm. Much greater interval. So interval just means like the, the difference between two tones. A scale, who in here is a musician? Familiar with scales. Okay, a scale is a series of tones arranged one after the other. And if you do play an instrument or sing, you will spend hours and hours and hours just practicing scales. So just to be aware of what those two words are. There's a Greek word, and there are a couple of Greek words in the middle of that paragraph. The first one is arithmos, which really just means numbers. But there's another one that's a little further down. Let's see if this little guy works today. So it looks like this in Greek. Phi, upsilon, sigma, iota, sigma. If we transliter transliterated it into English, it would be P H Y S I S. Physis. It means nature. It comes from, I think it comes from the Greek word to be born. 
So it's the concept Mrs. Chavez was talking about, and we were kind of talking about, I guess, a lot at the beginning of seminar, what you're born with, your nature, what makes you who you are. It's a really important word in philosophy and in many of today's disciplines, science, scientific disciplines as well. So phusis is the word right in the middle of the page. And then if you go down about six lines from the bottom, you're going to see the word cause underlined. Do you see that? What Greek buzzword from the Mediterranean philosophers gets translated into the English cause? It can mean principle, cause, or source. The Mediterranean philosophers were looking for the basic principle or cause. Or RK. So this English word is translating the Greek word RK, which would be alpha, rho, chi, eta, or if we transliterated it, A R C H long E. So that's another important word just to be aware of. So you're going to kind of bump into some Greek words throughout this. The writer is assuming that the students have studied Greek and can read them. Tackle them if you can. If you can't, just highlight them, skip over them, and we'll talk about them when we get to class. So do as much, like, there are some pages of this book that are really going to challenge you. It's going to challenge me to go back to this and figure them out, because it's been 30 years since I studied this stuff. So choose, pick and choose the pages you want to tackle. If you can tackle the math, and the hardest part of it is compound ratios, extra credit. Right? if you want to try to tackle the harder math parts. Otherwise, just pick the pages that you feel you can understand as you read and annotate. And then when we come to class, if we, if I can get permission, maybe we can sit in on part of the band practice and just listen to the music, right? And then we can have the piano room to ourselves and we can mess around with the piano and go through some of the exercises in there. And any other musical instruments I can scrounge up. You're free to go. Uh, put your reading, today's reading in your journal, turn your journal in, take the music reading with you, and have a safe trip home. Thank you.